Hey, everybody out there. Uh, it's good to be back. My name is Pat Fahey. I'm the content director for the Cicerone Certification Program. I'm also a master Cicerone. Uh, and we're coming together this week to talk about American Pale Ale. So cheers to everybody out there. Just as a reminder, either for those of you who are here often or as a notice to people who are here for the first time, uh, every week we get together with Tasting Together and try to cover some topic from the general canon of different beer topics. Um, a lot of what we've covered have been beer styles, but we're starting more and more to branch out into different topics. Uh, last week, we had Neil Witte on talking about vice beer. So if you missed that, be sure to go check that out. Um, if this is your first time, one thing I always like to say up front, make sure to ask questions as we're going. You're going to get a better experience out of this if you ask the questions that you are wondering about. Um, I won't necessarily take your questions as they come in, but I've got somebody aggregating the questions. So I should be able to respond to all of them by the end. Then uh, just a couple details before we get started, mostly just talking about um, schedule of various things. So uh, last week we had Neil fill in. I had to sub out to actually finish the first draft of the sensory book that I've been working on, which is now done and turned in, which I'm very excited about. Um, so had to uh, have him swap in last minute for that. Next week, I'm also going to be taking off this time to celebrate being done with uh, the first draft of the book. So next week, we're going to be having Belgian Golden Strong Ale, and Neil is going to be doing that one. Um, as some of you may or may not know, Neil worked for Boulevard for a very long time, including for a brief period of time while they were owned by Duval. Um, they, they purchased Duval, I think maybe, or Duval purchased Boulevard maybe a couple years before Neil left. And so he has a lot of insight about that brand specifically and a lot of love for that style. So should be a really fun session with him talking about that. Um, the following week, July 29th, I'm going to be back to talking about pairing beer with spicy food. And I wanted to kind of bring together both a few different dishes and a few different beers. Um, I'm going to try and make sure that I have all of them in front of me for the session. But if you can only get like one or two of them, that's totally fine, at least when it comes to the, the food side of thing. I haven't totally finalized. And when, when I do finalize, I'll be putting up both the food and the beer, probably have Neil mention it next week, and then we'll put it up on the blog post and then also on the description for that video. But at least preliminarily, what we're thinking of doing is doing some sort of like a buffalo sauce sort of thing. I'll probably end up doing like uh, buffalo, buffalo wings. Um, though you could do tofu or cauliflower or like literally anything with buffalo sauce on it. Um, I'll be doing probably a red Thai coconut curry with a fair amount of heat to it, which should be fun. And then uh, kind of still toying around with what the third one will be. But right now I'm thinking of maybe doing like a Caribbean uh, jerk chicken sort of thing that I might just make here. So um, so yeah, if anybody has anything else that they think would be really cool, probably not going to do any Doritos, Tacos Locos, but, uh, but I'll keep it in mind. I'll think about it. Um, and I'm going to play around with a few different beers this weekend to figure out what I'd like people to have on hand to be tasting for the session. So once again, I'll make sure within the next week or so that that stuff is up on the blog and that Neil is able to relay that information so that people have a good idea of what beers and, and what foods we're going to be tasting. But that's one, once again, since I do want to do several different permutations of things where if you're only able to try like one of them well during the session, but then can kind of take what you learn and go and try a bunch of other things in the coming weeks, like you'll still find that to be a very valuable experience. Uh, 
And then the last one that I have on here or that we have on the schedule right now is one that somebody actually sort of requested a while ago. Uh, and that's just sort of a general talk on how to do style discrimination. Um, specifically, I am going to be tasting and talking a little bit about the American wheat beer style and the whipped beer style, which we've already covered. Mostly, I just like will take any excuse to drink more whipped beer. So, I, and I figured since that is one that sometimes shows up on like the certified cistern exam, that that would be a good one to get in front of people. Um, but the focus is not going to be on those two styles. The focus is going to be on style discrimination more generally. Um, how to use style discrimination to help you learn to better understand beer styles, but then also how to perform style discrimination exercises if you have a test that you take that features style discrimination. So uh, that's going to be kind of the focus of that one, and that should be a really fun one as well. And I think that that's all that I have for opening notes. So I'm going to move on with talking about the beer. Like I said, this week we're doing American Pale Ale. I have one of my favorites, the super classic Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Cheers once again. It's just a phenomenal beer. If you, I saw a number of people say that they're drinking Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Um, I saw a few other ones in there as well. If you haven't let us know already what you're drinking, throw it out in the chat. It's always always fun to see what people in different parts of the country or different parts of the world are uh, are drinking. So, when it comes to glassware for the style, I always like to talk about glassware at the uh, the opening. And um, classic for a lot of American styles would just be like a standard shaker pint, you know, kind of like straight sided glass. Uh, shaker pints are kind of boring though and they don't do a whole lot for the beer either from like a you know aromatic perspective but also not from an aesthetic perspective like i think beer in a tulip glass just looks good and beer in a shaker glass looks fine but not nothing special about it so um i typically don't use shaker pints a lot at home um nonic pint if i'm going for something that's sort of like similar shape like Nonic point pine at least brings a little bit of visual appeal to it. So that's, that's a glass shape that I do keep around and will use for, for certain things. But um, as people have kind of caught on to at this point, I, I use tulip glasses for the vast majority of beers that I, that I drink at home at least. So let's talk about the history of the American pale ale style a little bit. And one of the reasons why this is a really fun one to do is because the history of American pale ale is very much intertwined with the history of American craft brewing. You know, we cover a lot of this stuff in the, the Road to Cicerone American Styles book, but early American craft brewing as I would imagine some of you already know, very much kind of grew out of uh, home brewing subculture here in the US. And you know, to this day, a lot of new brewers do start out home brewing before they move into sort of the professional world of brewing. But at least in the early days, you know, we look at the start of the American craft movement being like the late seventies, early eighties that coincides with when homebrewing was legalized here in the U S and when that happened there, because homebrewing had just been legalized, there weren't like a lot of resources that people could go find. Like, I don't know what there was in terms of early American homebrewing books. I want to say Charlie Papazian's joy of homebrewing was probably one of the first and I, I looked that up before this. I think that was published in 1984. So prior to that, people who wanted to learn more about homebrewing or brewing in general and were looking for inspiration often turned to British brewing texts. 
And so much of the early American brewers understanding of brewing and, and much of kind of the culture that they pulled from the styles that they tried to emulate were British styles. Um, and American pale ale is a perfect example of that. So American pale ale is a pretty direct descendant of English pale ale type beers, you know, thinking like the family of English bitters. Um, but it was as brewers around the world have done for centuries, it was American brewers interpretation of that style using the ingredients that they had available to them. And in particular, in this case, it was using a hefty dose of American hops. Um, you know, at this point in time, we were you know, a couple decades, maybe three decades actually post World War II. British beer at this point in time was super low in alcohol. Most of the stuff fallen in like the three to 4% range. So in emulating the style, American brewers would have been bumping up the alcohol content a little bit, bumping up the hopping rates and, and incorporating uh, American hop varieties. The, the one that really played a big role early on was Cascade hops specifically. So a lot of people hold Sierra Nevada pale ale up as kind of the original American pale ale. And it is definitely a prototype for the style. I've seen some places quoted that state that it's the first American pale ale. I don't think that that is accurate. Um, you know, Sierra Nevada released this beer. I, I think they brewed it for the first time in, in fall of 1980, but, uh, went through several iterations and didn't actually release the beer until 1981. Um, you can look at like Anchor Liberty Ale, which uh, sort of straddles the space between an American pale ale and an American IPA by the beers that are made today. Like by the standards of beers made today, I'd call it closer to an American pale ale than an American IPA, but you could make an argument for either camp. But that beer came out in 1975. Um, it was neither called an American pale ale nor an American IPA because those terms just like weren't in standard usage really at the time. Uh, New Albion Brewing Company, which is regarded by a lot of people as sort of the first American microbrewery to open post-prohibition. Um, they opened in 1976 with a pale English inspired ale hopped with Cascade. So sort of also in that American pale ale space. But it was definitely Sierra Nevada that really sort of took this style and popularized it and grew it to the point where throughout the 1980s, as American craft beer was just kind of starting to become a thing, um, this style very much came to define that movement and was very much the most popular beer being made by small American craft breweries throughout the 80s on into the early 90s. Uh, at some point, American IPA sort of overtook it in terms of popularity and became the new standard bearer for American craft beer, which continues on to this day with classic American IPAs, but also endless permutations of different sub-styles. Um, but yeah, American Pale Ale was super foundational to, to American craft brewing. And continues to be just an awesome style of beer. Um, so to talk a little bit about the way that this beer is made, it's a pretty straightforward recipe. Uh, in terms of the grist, you're looking at primarily pale ale malt, though most of these kind of cribbing from British bitters are going to be featuring a little bit of extra character malts to give them a little bit more malt flavor. Um, I think Sierra Nevada pale ale, for example, uses a small amount of crystal malt to give it additional color and a little bit of sweetness, and a little bit of extra kind of like caramel toast flavor. Uh, but you'll see brewers use other like small amounts of other highly kilned or more highly kilned malts, like maybe a Vienna or a Munich, um, something like a biscuit or a victory malt, like any of those are fair game. Majority is going to be pale ale malt, but 
you'll see addition of some of these other ones to uh, build up the malt profile a little bit. Now, hops are what this beer, I don't know if I want to say it's like what this beer is all about. At the time that this beer was first made, this was like a crazy hoppy beer. Like this was unprecedented. And it was, it leaned on American hop varieties, which up until that point, like there's, there are quotes in European brewing texts where they're like, yeah, there are American hop varieties, but like you don't use them in brewing because they're like brash and nasty and they just like, they don't make good beer. Um, so, you know, the specific characteristics that we get from some of these hop varieties were considered to be a little too over the top for more traditional brewers. Um, but around this period of time, we had brewers in the U.S. who were like, you know what, we're going to we're going to lean in. And honestly, I think Anchor probably was one of the first breweries to really leverage uh, American hops at a, at a higher hopping rate, you know, like Cascade, which hadn't seen a ton of use in brewing prior to the mid seventies. I think Coors was using Cascade, but like at a very low level and not really for aroma. Um, Anchor Liberty, which is another Cascade hopped beer. It's one of the first beers that really sort of leaned all in on like, we're going to hit you in the face with American hop character. And that's kind of a big part of the flavor profile of these beers. So when you see breweries making American pale ales today, it doesn't have to be those classic American varieties. When I say classic American varieties, I think things like Cascade, but also Centennial, Chinook, um, maybe also like Columbus, but in particular, those three, Cascade, Centennial, and Chinook are the, the three that really stick out to me. Um, today, you'll see people making these with any varieties of hops, uh, usually not like traditional old world variety of hops. You're not going to see like traditional English hops or traditional German hops showing up in American pale ale, but like any of the newer, more in vogue American hop varieties like Simcoe, Amarillo, uh, Citra, Mosaic, or anything like El Dorado, uh, Cashmere, like anything, Lemon Drop, anything more recently popular, those are all fair game. Also like New World varieties from Australia and New Zealand, uh, like Nelson Sauvin, Galaxy, uh, Ruwaka, Mochueca, like all of those are, are fair game for American pale ale at this point. We talk about the yeast that's used for these beers. These beers are an ale, obviously, from the name. Um, so they're using an ale yeast, which could potentially give you a little bit of fermentation character, but in most cases, uh, breweries are going to use a relatively neutral yeast strain. Kind of the classic one is the, the so-called Chico yeast strain that Sierra Nevada uses. Um, and it's a pretty clean fermenter. It doesn't produce a ton in the way of, of fermentation flavor. So most of the flavors that you do get in the style and beer style of beer are going to be malt or hop derived. So let's see, talk a little bit about the flavor of this beer specifically. It definitely, it definitely leads with hops. Um, and for me, this is just kind of like super classic expression of, of cascade hops. I want to say like just drinking loads and loads of this beer, this beer being a single hop beer, all cascade kind of built for me an understanding of, of what that hop tends to present like. And in this beer, at least it's very, definitely has some citrus character, maybe kind of in the light grapefruit, a little bit of tangerine, peel kind of character, um, a little bit of a piney character, not like super resiny, but like, uh, like evergreen needles. Um, Avery said spruce tips when we were tasting it earlier. So kind of just like a, a lighter and a, and a fresher sort of piney character. Um, maybe even a little bit of like a, a light mintiness or light like spearmint character to it as well. 
It also has a fair amount of malt character. Um, you know, at least in the world of IPA and like West Coast IPA, we've definitely seen malt character diminish in hoppier styles. A lot of breweries will make IPAs that have virtually no malt character to them. They're like straw or light gold in color. Uh, we haven't seen that as much in the world of American Pale Ale, but still I would say that over the years they've trended towards less malt character. This one is like a really classic version, still has a lot of, of malt to it. Like there's a pretty rich backbone of like toasty sort of bread crusty notes with maybe a light caramel undertone um, that sort of supports the, the hop aroma that we get in this beer. There's not much in the way of yeast aromatics. Like I said, it's it's a beer made with a relatively neutral strain of yeast. Um, and then on the palate, it has pronounced bitterness. It definitely doesn't trend towards kind of that assertive level that I would expect out of an American IPA, but like firm pronounced bitterness uh, to it. If If you're like, if you're used to just drinking IPAs, you might drink this and be like, nah, it's not a bitter beer, but it's, you know, it has a pretty significant charge of bitterness, especially at the time when this beer came out, this would have been like, I don't know, people, I, I imagine people were like, what is this when they first had this beer? Um, and that could totally just be my romantic imagining of, of early enjoyment of the style, but uh, but yeah, it definitely would have stood out as very different from other beers being made at the time. All in all, given it's kind of moderate alcohol content, I want to say it's a little north of 5.5. Five, um, and it's pronounced but not over-the-top bitterness – it's a pretty easy drinking beer, dare I say quaffable. Uh, I, this is certainly one for me that's like a it's, a, it's a drinker. This is a beer to like sit around and, and have a couple of. And that kind of plays into how it works within the realm of pairing, at least, uh, you know, I, I have talked a lot about how there are beers that can work alongside a lot of things just through their sheer drinkability. And American Pale Ale, I think, definitely fits that bill as well. This is a beer that I think works with a really, really wide variety of different food items. Um, I think it's kind of like the, the one of the ultimate backyard barbecue sorts of beers. It's, you know, it has, between the malt flavor and the hop flavor, there are a lot of different flavors that the beer has working for it that it can be used to sort of harmonize or link up with whatever you're trying to pair it with. But with the carbonation and the bitterness and the overall drinkability of the beer, it'll also clean up um, kind of fatty or palate coating things. So like anything that comes off the grill, I feel like probably pairs pretty well with this beer. Uh, it's good for like any sort of standard pub fare one use of this beer that like I've really enjoyed in the past, I think it works really nice with like a bitter green salad, like do a bitter green base of like arugula, maybe watercress. Um, and then maybe sprinkle in like some toasted nuts, either like toasted walnuts, toasted almonds to sort of pick up on the, uh, on the malt characteristics in the beer toss in a little bit of cheese, either maybe a little aged cheddar or a little bit of a blue cheese to sort of sink in with the bitterness and some of the hop aromatics. And like, you can build a really beautiful pairing between those two things. So in terms of things I wouldn't pair it with, like the only things that come to mind off the top of my head are like maybe delicate fish, um, there aren't a ton of desserts that I would want to put a uh, pale ale with necessarily. You could definitely make it work, but it, it might be a little bit of a stretch. 
goes great with a wide variety of different ethnic cuisines and also uh, lump spicy food in with that. Like the bitterness is not so intense that it's going to create like a really overwhelming fire if you're trying to pit um, this beer up against something that's really spicy. So I think of like, like shrimp tacos with a squeeze of lime or like, I don't know, a lot of different curries I think would work nicely with, with this sort of beer. So it's just a great beer. Works well with a lot of things. So let's take a look at questions that have come in. And if you have any questions, feel free to throw them out now. Chris asks, if a tulip glass is so perfect for any style, parentheses, I agree, why does Cicerone make you study which glass you should use for each style? So when you talk about which glass you should use, it's it more relates to how the beer is traditionally served. Um, and in some cases, especially for beers that are coming from either Belgium or Germany or the UK, uh, it's how those beers have been served in their traditional cultures. And while I think beer generally looks good in a tulip glass and I think that uh, tulip glass does fine things for just about any uh, any style of beer. There's something to be said for like the it, it definitely builds the experience to be enjoying the beer from a glass shape that it's traditionally served in. Um, there's like a there's an intangible quality there to just kind of like completing your immersion in the beer experience. And there are styles that like, well, I will drink them out of, uh, out of a tulip. I definitely enjoy them more out of more classic glassware. Like I think about like, you know, we did uh, Czech premium pale lager, like Pilsner or Kell out of a half liter Stein is just a much more in, it just, it feels right. Like I put that, I'll put that beer in a tulip glass. I'll drink it. It's fine. But like, it feels right to drink it out of that glass. Um, same thing with like British bitter. Like I want that in a, in a nonic pint or maybe a pub mug. Same thing with mild, any like classic British styles. Um, there are a lot of styles that I'll put in, in a tulip and a lot of Belgian styles in particular, because tulips are used classically for a lot of different Belgian styles. And uh, there's such a range of different glassware used in Belgian beer. Um, it, that I think is a place where it's like, you can put a Belgian beer in a tulip glass and I, would, I wouldn't bat an eye at it. But some of those other styles, particularly classic English styles, classic, classic British styles or Scottish styles or Irish styles um, and classic German and Czech styles, Typically, I'm going to want to put those in, in, in if I can, if I have it at home in a, in a glass that's more suited to them. And uh, I have some of that here at home. In some cases, it's just a, you know, it's a matter of like space. I will go with the utilitarian tulip just to keep from having like two entire cabinets full of glassware. So, but if I'm at a bar where and, and once again, with Cicerone, like we're trying to help people understand the best way to present these things in the best of circumstances. I'm not going to as great a length when I'm drinking beer at home by myself um, as I would if I were operating an establishment and wanted to give customers like a really immersive and incredible beer experience in that case where it's like, you know, no, your primary function is to build an experience for people. Um, going the extra mile with things like properly matched glassware really does, uh, you know, I, I really think it really does build a better experience. That's like way more about that question than I meant to say, but I hope I didn't just like bore everybody to death. <laughs> Let's see, Ophelia asks, what is the biggest distinguishing factor between American pale ale and uh, American IPA? Uh, 
Intensity. Um, there, when we teach about these styles, we teach about them almost in the same breadth because they're in a lot of cases, especially with classic American pale ale and classic American IPA, they're like the same recipe more or less. It's just IPA has more, has more alcohol, has more malt character in some cases. It definitely has more bitterness, has more hop flavor and aroma. So, you know, American pale ale, I think the ABV range is like four, five to six, two. American IPA, it's like five, five to seven, five. American pale ale bitterness is 30 to 50 IBUs versus 40 to 70 for American IPA. So you're just kind of, and, and as you can see from both of those ranges, there is some overlap. There are definitely beers that exist sort of in the middle ground. Um, I saw somebody said they were drinking a Dale's pale ale. Dale's is one of those beers where it's like, they call it a pale ale, but like it's six and a half percent alcohol and like 65 IBUs. Like that's, I would call that an IPA in most cases. Um, and like, if you served it blind to somebody, they'd probably call it an IPA in most cases. I will say that because of that overlap, that's never a style discrimination that will make people do on like a certified cistern exam. Like we'll have American pale ale versus uh, double IPA but we'll never ask somebody to taste a beer blind and tell us whether it's an American pale ale or an American IPA. There's just, there's too much overlap there. So if a single brewery makes one of each, the American IPA is going to be higher in alcohol and have more bitterness, more hop flavor and aroma. But when you look at them broadly, generally the IPA is going to be a little bit more intense, but there's a lot of overlap in, in sort of the middle Kevin asked, did the American IPA style come from Americans wanting more hops and that to find the style, or did the American IPA descend from the British IPA? It's a little bit of both. Um, my understanding is that American IPA kind of emerged uh, out of the popularity of American pale ale, but uh, obviously the name is descended from the British tradition of, of India pale ale. And uh, one of the things that I, I recall Ray telling me is that like in the early nineties, like it was either a, like a group of brewers went to the UK and they like did some research, digging up stuff about traditional IPA. They came back and like one guy from the group wrote an article about it that got published in one of the popular uh, beer magazines at the time. And that sort of became the template for a lot of American craft brewers at the time, their early iterations of American IPA. So that's one of the reasons why when you look at a lot of the IPAs that were first formulated in the early 90s, they all do map to such a similar flavor profile is that they were all kind of based off of this one article. But uh, but yeah, so to answer your question, it's a little bit of both, but I think the public desire or maybe more appropriately, like the, the niche beer nerds slash people who worked in beer desire for a beer like that was born out of, you know, becoming more acquainted with the American pale ale style and being like, but what if it was more? So I do think that that plays in a lot to how the style developed. Excuse me for a moment. See, Jake asks, I'm drinking a beer classified as a pale ale on untapped, but the can calls it an American mosaic ale. Is mosaic ale technically a BJCP style? Decidedly not. Um, you know, mosaic is a specific hop bridle. In the brewery calling something an American mosaic ale, they're probably just saying, or they're trying to just imply that it's an American pale ale that's hopped either exclusively or primarily with mosaic. So, you know, one of the things about BJCP style guidelines and style guidelines generally is in order to prevent there from being hundreds and hundreds of different, very narrowly defined styles, styles will typically accommodate a range of different flavor profiles within a general set of characteristics. And like I was kind of saying earlier, like there are a lot of different hot varieties that breweries can use to make American pale ale mosaic is one of them. Um, but the BJCP doesn't break down things into like American mosaic ale or American citra ale, 
though breweries will sometimes say that this is like a citra pale ale or, you know, will reference the hops in their naming. Let's see. Pat Henry asks, what were American hops grown for prior to becoming popular in beer? Uh, it's not that they wouldn't have been used in beer. It's just that they wouldn't have been used to flavor beer. Um, they would have been used primarily for bittering. And if you look at a lot of the beer that was being made in like post prohibition America, a lot of it was sort of like, like American lager ish type beer stuff that really didn't have very much in the way of uh, hop flavor and aroma. And so bittering levels would have been pretty low. Hops that were being grown here would have been used for just for bittering. And you know, if you go pre-prohibition when you had you know, German immigrants here trying to make classic iterations of, of Pilsner, they would have been using hop varieties that more closely mimicked the traits of, of sort of classic noble hops. They weren't like making Pilsners with Cascade. I don't remember when Cascade came into being, but I want to say it was sometime in the sixties when it was, when it was released. Uh, so that's not a hop that's been around for like centuries. Um, yeah. Let's see. So I've got a question here about uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale's or Sierra Nevada's choice to croisin the beer, um, saying that it's unusual for bigger breweries to do that. I don't think that Sierra Nevada croisins the beer. Croisoning is a technique where um, brewers will add a portion of like actively fermenting beer, a small portion of actively fermenting beer to, uh, to beer when it's finishing maturing and sort of the yeast that's active in that, in that portion will, uh, clean up any remaining like fermentation byproducts like diastol or acid aldehyde will also serve to kind of help carbonate the beer. What Sierra Nevada does do, and maybe what this was kind of meant to imply is uh, they do bottle condition their beer. Um, and that is certainly, it's not a terribly unusual technique, but at least for a brewery of their size, there are not a lot of breweries that big that are bottle conditioning their beer. Bottle conditioning just means uh, that the brewery rather than force carbonating the beer, rather than just applying carbon dioxide pressure to carbonate the beer, they're going to be packaging it with some active yeast and a small amount of residual sugar, and then allowing it to undergo another re-fermentation within the bottle. Uh, and that fermentation is going to produce the carbon dioxide that ends up making for the carbonation in the beer. I read somewhere that their original choice to bottle condition the beer was, was purely because they didn't have the the capital early on to uh, like afford the equipment necessary to force carbonate. Um, obviously they have that capital now. I don't know if they <laughs> chose to continue doing it that way out of just sort of maintaining the way they were doing it or knowing Sierra Nevada, they do a lot of uh, experiments and testing on their beers to see what the impact of certain changes are. So I would imagine that they've probably determined that they get the specific character they want in this beer by bottle conditioning. And that's why they choose to continue doing it that way. Um, within the realm of bottle conditioning, like it's a pretty light addition of yeast. Like you can see my beer is still pretty clear and I've poured all of it into the glass. If this was like a, you know, like a, most classic Belgian styles of beer or uh, Hefeweizen, like there's usually a fair amount of yeast sediment at the bottom of bottle conditioned beers, but because of the way Sierra Nevada does it, there is very, very little sediment. And so you can usually even pour the entirety of, of the package, even though it is bottle conditioned. Let's see. 
Don Yosh asks, is barley wine considered an imperial American pale ale? Um, you know, that's honestly, that's kind of, that's not a bad way to think about it. Because when you look at like from a recipe perspective, I talked about how kind of American pale ale and American IPA are sort of very similar recipes, just scaled up. The next scale up is not necessarily double IPA. Um, the more logical scale up from American IPA, at least classically made American IPAs, is American barley wine. The reason being that a lot of breweries, when they make double IPAs, the focus is supposed to be pretty exclusively on the hops. And so in order to do that, brewers oftentimes will sub in some amount of sugar in order to lighten up the body of the beer versus American barley wine, where you're scaling it up, but you're also scaling up the malt. So you get a ton of like malt flavor and caramel and toffee, but you're still using a base recipe that's usually mostly pale ale malt, maybe a little bit of crystal malt in, in the case of some American barley wines. So I, I don't, I think if you talk to somebody about a barley wine and you're like, well, this is an American, an imperial American pale ale, they would look at you funny. But from like a conceptual level, that's basically what it is. It is just kind of like a very scaled up version of that style. And at least in the British tradition of barley wine, like it's very much the same thing. English barley wine was just sort of like the logical end point of a really, really scaled up version of a British bitter. So yeah, that's a reasonable way to think about it. Let's see, the question here, is it typical of American pale ale to have adjunct grains like wheat apart from widely used corn and rice grain adjuncts? Um, I would say the adjuncts in general are not common in the American pale ale style, certainly not rice and corn. Um, brewers are typically making these all, as all malt beers. They aren't looking to use rice or corn to lighten out or thin out the body or flavor profile of, of like the malt characteristics. Uh, other grains like wheat or red in a typical American pale ale, probably not. Um, you might see people make like a rye pale ale, like a rye PA. Uh, I don't know if Founders still even makes that beer, but they had a red rye pale ale, I, I believe for a very long time. So uh, you'll sometimes see people doing like variations or different takes on the style using that sort of thing. But classic American pale ale is going to be a 100% barley malt beer. Let's see. I'm being asked by David why I'm not drinking a half acre daisy cutter. That's a fair question. Um, I went with Sierra Nevada pale ale in part because it's just like, it's such a classic. I mean, it is like, it's the quintessential example of the style. Daisy Cutter is a great example of a locally made pale ale-ish thing here. The other reason why I wouldn't necessarily go with Daisy Cutter though, is because it kind of falls into the same territory as Dale's Pale Ale. Um, I can't remember the exact stats on it, but I think Daisy Cutter is six and a half percent alcohol. And I think, I don't know where the IBUs fall, but they're up there. Um, you, Drake Daisy Cutter Blind, it drinks closer to an IPA than it does to an American pale ale. Uh, in, you know, in today's landscape of, of tons and tons of IPAs, it would definitely fall on the low end of the IPA spectrum. But like it's a bit over the top for a classic example of the style, which is another reason why I wouldn't necessarily go that, that route. Let's see. Alexander asks, how can I develop my nose? I feel like I'd need pines and mint and tropical fruit at the same time to smell it out of the beer. That is a great question. And you already sort of gave the answer. So one of the ways to do flavor training is to utilize the, you know, when we're looking for certain flavors in a beer, if you haven't seen the beer flavor map, check out the beer flavor map because it gives you a really comprehensive list of the wide variety of, of different flavors that can show up in a beer. But um, 
one of the ways that I always advocate for people to do flavor training and one of the ways that I have done it and continue to do it because it's an ongoing practice is take food items that uh, appear as, as flavor terms and like smell them. And as you're smelling them, think about that flavor, or maybe say the word of that flavor. What you're doing when you are having that experience is you're building up your brain's sort of flavor image or like memory bank of that flavor. So even just getting like mint and smelling mint and going and saying out loud, like mint will help you to sort of internalize that flavor over time. What helps even more is to do um, recognition testing. So like one thing that we'll do with people that you can do on your own at home is like, Grab a bunch of film canisters or otherwise opaque vessels, put several different flavoring things in or put like a different flavoring thing in each one of them. So maybe like mint in one and basil in another and coriander in one and cloves in another. Label them on the bottom and test yourself by just smelling them and trying to identify it. And it's very important to give yourself like the immediate feedback so that you know for sure whether or not you were right or wrong, because if you're wrong, but you know your brain will use that information to sort of correct your idea of the thing over time. But doing that sort of repetitive testing will make it easier and easier for you to recognize those aromas um, just sort of naturally, which will then make it easier to pick them out of something like a, like a beer. The more and more training you do like that, you get to a point where, uh, you know, you might smell the beer now and be like, it just smells like beer to me. Um, but with practice, you get to a place where it's like, oh, that's like, that's like grapefruit peel, like ruby red grapefruit peel, just because you've done work kind of learning those different flavors. And that extends to things that I wouldn't necessarily eat, like pine needles, like put pine needles in a film canister, like break them open so that they express their essential oils and smell them. They have some of the same aroma compounds that are present in a beer like this. And that will help you build your descriptive vocabulary. Is that a thing you need to do to enjoy beer? Absolutely not. But like, if you want to get better at identifying flavor in beer or wine or spirits or like anything, that sort of practice is one of the best ways to do it. And yes, like I, I saw somebody saying film canister and laughing about it. I don't know that, that you can even get like, that you can even buy film, like I'm sure you can, but like you can still buy film canisters. Amazon or the internet is a magical place. Let's see, Jake asks, for the certified cistern exam, should I worry about differentiating a session IPA versus a pale, uh, an American pale ale or an IPA? That's an, another one that's like too close to call. We wouldn't test you on that. Um, I kind of laughed at the session IPA term when it first came around several years ago because a session IPA is basically just like a heavily hopped American pale ale. Um, and it's just capitalizing on the fact that you slap the name IPA on a beer and it will sell more. Um, but at this point, there are enough breweries that have made session IPA type beers. Um, and from a balanced perspective, they are somewhat different. So I, I will give them that. Uh, but it's close enough in character to an American pale ale and to an American IPA that we would never put one in front of you and expect you to be able to pick the two pick one of those two styles. Let's see. Chris asks about the difference between an American pale ale and a California common California common being basically anchor steam. Um, they're like California common is the generic. It's the style name for anchor steam. There are other breweries that will very occasionally make one, but it's, it's basically just anchor steam. And anchor steam is fermented with a lager yeast, but fermented at higher than normal temperatures. That's sort of the whole idea behind the steam beer concept. As a result, 
the yeast will usually produce a little bit of ester character. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily compare California Common and American Pale Ale as the, the closest styles. I look at California Common and American Amber Ale as being two styles that are very close in character because uh, California Common and Anchor Steam are a little bit darker than most Pale Ales would be. Um, so if you're comparing it to an American Pale Ale, you probably see a little bit more uh, like caramel and toast character out of that beer than you do out of something like this. Otherwise, they're pretty similar. Uh, Anchor Steam in particular tends to have a very specific hop profile since it's brewed using Northern Brewer hops, which are described as like minty and, and woodsy. But um, but yeah, it's they're, they're very similar styles, to be honest. Let's see. Andrew asks, how do you think bottle conditioning affects hop aroma and flavor? I would think the extra time in bottle slash can would diminish hop aroma. It is true that like hop flavor and aroma are some of the faster elements of a beer to break down. However, you know, bottle conditioning for a beer like this is probably going to take 10 days or less. Um, if I had to guess, it's probably somewhere between seven and 14 days, but I would guess towards the lower end of that. Um, so you're not going to see a, a tremendous amount of degradation. Um, the character will change a little bit, but not, not hugely. Um, and this is a style that well hoppy is not like, this isn't a New England IPA. This isn't built on, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of, of dry hop and dry hop character. So, and I don't know for sure, but it's also possible that because some portions of the hop flavor and aroma are derived during the boil in a beer like this, that they're a little bit more stable to time. I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but, um, but I feel like in general, dry hop character tends to degrade more rapidly in, in beer. So Which leads perfectly into my next question from Jake, which is how long has dry hopping beer been a thing? Is it a relatively new practice in the brewing community? It's not new by any stretch of the imagination. Um, if I, I could be a hundred percent wrong in this, but my understanding is that the practice originally would have stemmed from English brewers adding hops to cask beer when they packaged it. I could be wrong about that, but I think that that's where the practice originally comes from. And so that's a, a practice that's pretty old. It's been around for a while. I would say it's more recent, like within the last 10 to 15 years, maybe that it's been so widely adopted by brewers in the U S particularly for making highly hop styles like American beers and that, or sorry, like American IPAs. And then taking that to like, it's, the absurd limits that we sometimes see in styles like New England IPA. Um, this is a, a style, American pale ales can be dry hops. Sierra Nevada pale ale is not. And dry hopping, sorry if I didn't, I didn't say this up front, but dry hopping is adding hops to beer either during fermentation or more commonly after primary fermentation is finished, but while the beer is still in the fermenter by adding hops at that stage, there isn't any heat involved. And so you don't end up cooking off any hop aromatics. You end up dissolving a lot more of the hop aroma compounds into the beer through dry hopping. So today you'd be, I would think you'd be hard pressed to find a brewer making an American IPA that's not dry hopping it. Um, but American pale ale is still plenty of them that don't get dry hopped. So yes, it's not a new thing, but it is relatively new that it's become as popular and as prominent as it is today. Let's see. And let's finish up. <laughs> 
Shana <laughs> mentioned that people are talking about California common versus alt beer, which is just like, let's compare two super obscure styles to one another. Um, and I can talk about that super briefly. People will sometimes talk about California common and alt beer at the same time. And if in all honesty, I think I had to write an essay about the two of them when I took the master exam a long time ago. Um, but people sometimes talk about them at the same time because they're both considered hybrid styles. Uh, and what people mean when they say hybrid style is it's a beer that utilizes one sort of yeast, either ale or lager yeast, and then like conditions from uh, from the other yeasts sort of normal fermentation. So California common, lager yeast, but warmer than usual fermentation temperatures ends up causing the lager yeast to behave a little bit more like an ale yeast in terms of the fermentation flavor profile that it puts out. Alt beer is the reverse. You have much in the way like a Kolsch, you have ale yeast being fermented at slightly cooler temperatures diminishes the amount of esters that that yeast tends to put out. Now, I would say alt beer leans a lot more heavily into traditional noble hop varieties than because it uses noble hop varieties versus uh, California common, which does not. And so hop flavor profiles is a pretty big distinguisher there. Um, the malt flavor profile is usually going to be pretty different too. If I'm not mistaken, I would imagine that most California commons are probably a lot of pale ale malt, maybe a little, uh, maybe for the color, they probably get it from some crystal and then maybe some, some Vienna or Munich, maybe. Whereas I would imagine all beer is, is usually more of like a, a lot of Vienna malt or maybe Pilsner malt, Munich malt mix. So you get a pretty different malt flavor profile out of, out of the two styles. Yeah. And I'm going to finish on this note from Max. I read recently that the name for dry hopping may originate from the idea that dry hopping will lead to hop creep that dries the finished beer out. Is there any more to that than romantic lore? I don't know. That sounds like a, a stretch to me. Um, I don't know that I want to get into all of the different parts of, of what that question even means. <laughs> um, but it's not impossible, but it strikes me as unlikely. So, And I think that's as good of a place as any to end. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me for another week of this. Um, please check in next week and drink some Duval with Neil. Uh, I am sad to be missing that one because that's uh, another style and another beer that is near and dear to my heart, but I'll look forward to linking up with most of you in a couple weeks to talk about spicy food. See you guys then.